From where have demons come? We're going to be looking to the scripture to explore this fascinating question. But as we do, it's important to remember, this is not a salvation issue, but it is worth exploring. So let's remain open as we look to answering this question about the origin of demonic beings. Now, I'm going to be challenging a very widely held, very traditional view. In fact, demons are not fallen angels. I'm going to be showing you that from scripture and then we're gonna be looking to the scripture to see about the origins of demons. I want you to tell me in the comments section from where do you believe demons have come? Who do you think that they are? Acts chapter 23 verse nine says this. So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. Here we see that the teachers of religious law were aware of a distinction between angels, fallen angels, and demonic beings. Now, we are aware of the fact that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, the scripture asks this question, are not all angels ministering spirits? So yes, angels are technically spiritual beings, but there's a big enough difference between angels and demonic spirits to where a distinction was drawn. Now, where does this idea come from, this idea that demons are simply fallen angels. Well, it comes from Revelation chapter 12, verse nine. Let's explore that verse now. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Now here we see that in fact, angelic hosts did rebel with Lucifer. They were cast out of heaven and thrown to the earth. That's a reality that happened. That was a part of the conflict in heaven that took place. But nowhere in this portion of scripture, in fact, nowhere in the entire context, do we see anything indicating that these fallen angels therefore took on the form of demonic beings. In fact, as we look through the New Testament, we see that fallen angels are still referred to as angels, but instead with a negative adjective attached before the name. So now let's look to the scripture to embolden the distinctions between angelic beings who have fallen and demonic spirits. And then after we do this, we'll look at the clues left to us in scripture to see about the actual origins of demonic beings. So distinction number one, demons need bodies. If you'll notice throughout the scripture, as you look at demonic beings, you see that they're like parasites in nature. They're constantly looking for bodies to possess. In Matthew chapter eight, verses 30 through 31, the Bible says there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding in the distance. So the demons begged, if you cast us out, send us into that herd of pigs. So demonic beings seem to be very uncomfortable with being without a physical body to possess. By contrast, as we look to the scripture, we see that angels actually have physical bodies. Genesis chapter six, verse four says, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, it's important to remember that in the Old Testament, the term sons of God is always a reference to supernatural beings. It's not until the New Testament that we see the term sons of God referring to people who have been redeemed and born again. Also, if the sons of God described in Genesis 6, 4 were not angelic beings, then this would not explain the supernatural rise of giants. Why would it be that natural human beings would produce giants? So in fact, we see very clearly here that this term sons of God is referring to angelic beings who had physical bodies and they were able to procreate with the daughters of men. Now, some might say, but Matthew chapter 22, verse 30 says, for when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But here the Bible is saying that angels don't enter into the covenant of marriage. This says nothing about whether or not they have physical bodies. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse two, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. There in that verse, we see that angelic beings are able to interact with human beings without being recognized, meaning that their physical manifestation here in the earth is very much like unto the physical human body. Also, we see in Luke chapter 24, verse four, that the angels at Christ's tomb were confused for human beings. 
The Bible says there, as they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. So anytime we see an angelic being interacting with someone on earth in the scripture, they're doing so with physical manifestation. In other words, angels have physical bodies, maybe not physical bodies that are exactly like yours or mine, but they do have some sort of way to communicate with, to interact with the earthly realm, very much like unto a physical body. By contrast, demonic spirits do not have that. We do not see demonic spirits appearing visibly to people in the scripture. And in fact, they're like parasites constantly in need of a host. Distinction number two, demons wander the earth. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, the Bible says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Here clearly we see that demonic beings wander the earth. By contrast, angels have the ability to go to the third heaven. We see this in Job chapter one, verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God, there's that term again used in the Old Testament. So this is a reference to a supernatural being, an angelic being. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So there in the book of Job, we see that Satan presented himself before the Lord. Now, we know that Satan was in his fallen form for a couple of reasons. John 10.10 10 says the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. So the devil was definitely already in his fallen state because we saw his motives in wanting to steal and kill and destroy in the life of Job. Also, Job chapter 22, verses 15 and 16 say this, Hast thou marked the way of old which wicked men have trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with a flood? So here we see that the book of Job takes place after the flood. So this is definitely after Satan was in his fallen state. So if Satan was in his fallen state when presenting himself to the Lord, it logically follows that his angels were also in their fallen state for this was after the rebellion definitely because it was after the flood. So there we see that very clear contrast. Demons, when they're cast out of someone, are bound to the earth and left to wander the earth whereas fallen angels are able to go from earth to the third heaven. This, by the way, is the reason why I believe that Ephesians 6, when it talks about spiritual wickedness in high places, is actually a reference to fallen angels and not specifically to demonic beings. Distinction number three, demons are called devils and unclean spirits. When referring to fallen angels, New Testament scriptures do not use the terms demons, devils, or unclean spirits. Instead, the Bible simply makes reference to fallen angels by using a negative description or a negative context. For example, let's take a look at these verses. 2 Peter 2, 4. For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So there we see that the scripture is definitely talking about fallen angels. And we know this because the Bible says the angels, and then it adds that sin. So it's adding a negative context to the term angels. Jude 1, 6 says, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So there again, we see the term angels being wrapped in a negative context. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 is another example of something like unto this. Then shall he say also unto them on the left, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So again, we see that term angels being wrapped in a negative context. We do not see the Bible referring to fallen angels as demons, unclean spirits, etc. The Bible simply uses the term angels but in a negative context or with a negative descriptor. So if demons are not fallen angels, what are they? To look for clues regarding their origins, we go back to Genesis chapter six, verse four. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. I want you to recall that in Revelation chapter 12, verse nine, the Bible tells us that Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. Why? 
they were cast out of heaven because they rebelled against God. So that was a punishment that was clearly recorded in the book of Revelation. But did you know that there's an entirely separate punishment that was placed upon angelic beings who had fallen? Let me show it to you. 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And then Jude 1, 6 is another example of this. But the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So here we see two punishments. Is this a contradiction? By no means. The angels that rebelled against the heavenly father in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, were sent to the earth. Now, some might say, well, wait a minute. Isn't it possible that when they were cast down from heaven and sent to the earth, that they were then at the same time placed in chains in darkness? Well, no, this can't be because we see them in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, committing another sin. So there was the sin of their rebellion, and then there was the sin of their procreation with the daughters of men. They could not have procreated with the daughters of men if they were chained from the time that they were first banished from heaven after rebelling against God. So very clearly we see here in the scripture that there are two sins followed by two punishments. The sin of rebellion against God, their punishment for that was being cast to the earth, and then their sin of procreating with the daughters of men. The punishment for that, they were chained in darkness to await the day of judgment. Now, why is this such a vile sin? Let's really explore this. Genesis 6, 5 through 7. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So think about how absolutely wicked this sin was. That these fallen angels, in their fallen rebellious state, decided to again rebel against God and unite with man in their rebellion against God. And so these fallen angels come in and procreate with the daughters of men, and the Lord looks and sees that it's just now reached a pinnacle of evil. They've crossed the line, and we have to start over. We have to begin again. Why was it that the Lord had to destroy the earth in a flood? It's precisely because the DNA of mankind was now polluted. Now, some give speculation as to why these fallen angels would procreate with the daughters of men. But I think that the best explanation that I've heard on this matter is that these demonic powers, I should say these angelic powers, were trying to pollute the DNA of man because they knew that it was in the generations of man that the Messiah would come. That it was through the bloodline that eventually the Savior of the world would come on the scene. And so trying to prevent the coming of the Son of Man, they tried to pollute the DNA. And this is what we see in Scripture, that God responds to this by wiping out the entirety of the human race, all but Noah and his family. So, I have a question for you. When a born-again believer dies, where do they go? They go to heaven. When a non-believer dies, where do they go? They go to hell. Where do fallen angels go, ultimately? Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. And angels who remain faithful to the Lord, where do they dwell? In the heavenly realm. So we see here that that which is evil is sent to hell. That which is redeemed has a place in heaven. Now let me ask you this. If these fallen angels really did come and procreate with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to a human fallen angel hybrid. Where do you think these giants, these, these, these twisted forms of creation would go once they died? Well, what happened here was that when the flood came, 
and wiped out all life on earth, the offspring of the fallen angels and the daughters of men, the ones who became giants, these very same were left upon the earth because of their hybrid nature. Now, I know, as I said earlier, this is a different sort of topic. And it is worth exploring. It's not a salvation issue, but this is what I believe the conclusion is. That demonic beings are actually the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. The human-angel hybrids that came about as a result of the rebellion of man and fallen angel. Which is precisely why God had to start over. It became that wicked. Think about how twisted, how wicked, how evil that is, that they would pollute their very own DNA. That those fallen creatures would try to prevent the coming of the Messiah through simple rebellion. Very wicked indeed. And so, these disembodied spirits are simply parasites. They are in constant need of a host. And this is why they possess bodies. You never see in the scripture spirit possession or soul possession. That's not even a biblical idea. Because to possess the spirit is impossible. Why that, 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 is, that, is what, that is what is united with God. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. To possess the soul, God wouldn't allow it. Why? Because the soul is the realm of decision. That's the will. Not even God himself gives himself power over our wills. He chooses to give us free will. So why would he let a demonic being take that over? Think about the man who had a legion of demons cast out of him. He ran to Jesus. I guarantee you it wasn't the demonic beings in him willing him toward his freedom. It was by his own will that he ran to the Lord despite what the demonic beings wanted. So his will was intact. Anytime you see someone being set free from demonic possession, their will was still intact. I'll tell you what wasn't their physical capacities. And so demonic beings always possess bodies, never spirits or souls. Why? Because they are parasites by nature. Thankfully, in the case of the believer, the believer has a body that is filled with the Holy Spirit. So now that you're aware of demonic origins, I want to pray with you a simple prayer. That the Lord would help you to be vigilant and aware of the supernatural realm. And I think that's important. As we cover topics like these, sometimes I think that the simplest application of these ideas is that we just become more aware of the supernatural realm. So that's my prayer for you today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to begin to open our eyes to the realm of the Spirit. Help us to be aware of the supernatural realm. And Lord, let us never become so materialistic, so consumed by this world, that we forget about the world that surrounds us that we forget about the realm of the Spirit. Help us, Father, to be vigilant, to be wise, and to be focused on you at all times. We thank you, Lord, for giving us discernment. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the tools that we need to fight the enemy. We honor and we bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. And I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, Amen. Hey, if you enjoyed this message, don't forget to leave a like so that you help spread the message further. And also make sure that you're subscribed to my channel so that you can continue to receive teaching like this and make sure you click that notification bell when you do. Now, I want to talk to you just for a few seconds about getting involved with the work of this ministry. We are focused on winning souls and building believers through events and media. All of the content is free. All of the live streams are free. All of our events all around the world are 100% free. And in order for us to continue to be able to do this, we need generous supporters like you to get involved. So if you're blessed by this ministry and you want to lend us a helping hand, I'm asking you to do your part today by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. And there you can give a one-time gift or sign up to become a monthly ministry supporter. Do as you're led. All gifts, large or small, one-time or monthly, help us in our mission. Now, if you enjoyed this message, then you will love why you're a threat to the kingdom of hell. In this message, I talk about the power and the dominion and the authority that God has given to you and why the enemy is trying to take that away.